Hello. Hello. If you want to look at your other fellow yogis, <laughs> or connect, look, be with. Wonderful to see everybody. Yes. Right. Shall we get started, Michelle? Sure. Okay. Well, finding a relatively comfortable seated posture for this part of our time together. Letting your eyes come to close. And feeling into the contours of your immediate surroundings, experience. And what we seem to experience in the space around us. And physical feeling and sound. And visual sensations that we may notice even with our eyes closed. Smells. And getting a sense of where the direct experience of the boundaries of our body seem to appear right now. Sensations on the outside, feeling into what we often experience as the inside. getting a sense of the flavors of the mental, emotional, interior. What are the textures and tones of the mind, heart? I feel most noticeable, almost clear. Just getting a sense of all of this material we have to work with, nothing beyond. And that which is seen smelled, tasted, heard, 
that which arises in experience of physicality, you know, its many qualities and dimensions, as well as the mind, heart. Distinct, but interwoven. And seeing if there is any sense of confidence in our ability to be in relationship with these six realms to some degree. Trusting that we don't have to go beyond what is directly experienced. I don't have to seek anything out that isn't immediately apparent. It is just within the directly observed that we can cultivate these beautiful qualities of mind, of Mindfulness, concentration, kindness, patience, determination, equanimity. Wisdom, faith. And yet, of course, it can be overwhelming. Even just these six sense doors, six sensitivities. So we learn this capacity to bring certain ones to the forefront. without rejecting or crushing the others. It's a sense of giving ourselves the opportunity to relate to a manageable field within all of it. And so, As you know, we will often encourage picking one sense door, one field of attention as the kind of primary field of practice. Receiving the stream of sound. There's often something very accessible something that we don't naturally identify with as our self. And sometimes has a more neutral quality. It can make it a good anchor. The sounds are not too jarring, too evocative. You receive the Texture, tone, vibration at the ears. And simply trying to be aware of that and how it changes. It requires a, a strength, a precision, an immediacy. Also a gentleness, a fluidity, a flexibility to keep up. Each moment new, out of our control.
not needing to manage or manipulate the sounds. Just trying to connect. Watch the rising and passing and not cling, not reject. And connect with the next moment and the new moment and the new moment. It's changing. Doesn't need to be anything more complicated. Noticing the difference between the sound and the thoughts, images, ideas, perceptions that the mind creates around them in reference to them. Seeing the difference between those two streams. Other sensations will arise and the other sense doors can notice them just in the same way, fleeting, ethereal, but perhaps of a different quality if they're coming from the body, sense of smell or sight. Sometimes, for many, it's supportive of our sense of presence and connection to include the entire field of bodily experience and what we're receiving, observing. even though it may feel very vast, the range of sensations very vast. Just like sound, we also see there's only one thing happening at any moment. And the moments are just moving very quickly. We don't need to do anything with what we observe. Just watch, receive, let go. The mind may also conjure an image, conjure a sense of mindness, me, identification with these experiences in a different way. You can see that as a mental construction. You receive the sounds, they're just sounds. You receive bodily sensations the same way. There's pressure, tingling, heat, coolness. Hardness, softness. Distinguishing between the, the 
mental overlay, perception, opinion. And sounds and physical experiences themselves. Sometimes it can help to narrow the field just to make it more manageable to where the hands are touching, making contact with each other or another part of the body. Or the rising and falling of area around the abdomen as the breath moves in and out on its own without our control. And we just observe we notice the mind wander, meander. It's fine. We just notice what is that mind? What is the texture and tone, quality of thought, imagining, emotion? Can we relate to it just as we are, the body, sounds? Coming back to the body or sounds, just as a somewhat easier place to train the attention. Observe. Receive, connect with strength and fluidity not pressuring the attention, not pressuring the body or sounds. Finding our way to the natural energetics, increasing, decreasing. So we simply try to commit to this observation, this presence with life as it unfolds.
still on the road without a bed. My auntie in Long Beach, California, she had this little music box that has, let's see, my abuelita, another auntie, we'll see. <laughs> I have these masks in the background or, or my dad's. It's um, good to be in a place with all these things of my people who have passed away. And I was um, on the road since Hollyhock for a couple of weeks visiting other friends and their families and got to meet up with a bunch of folks in uh, Portland, our Dhamma family there, which is very sweet. Nice to see people in person. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, some folks couldn't make it. They're protecting themselves and, and us and everyone from viruses. Mm. But it's still nice to be in the vicinity. Mm. I'm happy to be heading home tomorrow. So I think Michelle has an offering for today. I um, tend to appreciate more simple translations of complex terminologies. So the word vipassana, for example, the translation of it as being, being with the nature of how things are. Uh, so nature being something I think uh, we want to be more benign than it can be um, and that but the the kind of breadth and depth of Vipassana uh, is meant to include all experience any possible experience uh, so I think the word the translation of being with the nature of how things are is so so necessary and important because it tends to mirror and reflect where we have um, partiality about how things should be, for sure. Um, the, and I think as we live our life, we see there is such a vast range of joy and sorrow, you know, like such a inexplicable vast range of pleasant unpleasant and neutral in nature C cruelty and kindness um, even even not in the human world right even not the homo sapien but including homo sapiens and the um, there was a great poet contemporary poet of ours, Galway Canal, in one poem where he said, can we bless, can we bless, or at least not curse everything that struggles to stay alive on the planet. the Buddha taught that <coughs> all conditioned things, all everything that takes birth, seen and unseen on the planet, all, all conditioned things are arising and passing away. Understanding that brings the greatest happiness, the deepest happiness, which is peace. And in the, um, 
unfolding of sati, of mindfulness practice, we're meant to uncover and deepen our understanding of anicca, dukkha, and anatta. So the, the Buddha taught that if we apply, apply mindfulness to our moment-to-moment -moment experience, that insight will arise, insight will arise inevitably into anicca, dukkha, nata, anatta, meaning that every also any being that takes birth on this planet the three characteristics of existence apply to all of us on this planet. Impermanence, right? the unreliability of experience, and anatta, meaning um, the hardest to explain, right? that there's no solid, separate self. Uh, there's a corelessness to, to experience. Hmm. And I've um, mentioned this many times in the introduction to a book I bought when I was very young on Saigyo, the great poet Saigyo from Japan, um, who lived uh, many years ago. Five hundred. He lived five hundred years before Basho uh, in Japan, and I love that he had such a huge influence on him. But Saigyo lived at a time uh, in Japan where um, there had been 150 years of peace. And it was considered a very um, sophisticated civilization. But he, he was young in the time where the militarism and extinguishment of that peaceful era, extinguishment of that peaceful era happened in his lifetime. So in the um, introduction of the book, and I bought it secondhand, so I used to, there were many notes, <laughs> there were many notes that I didn't make in the book that I really loved. I was very, I lucked out when I found this book uh, and in the introduction, he talks about, William Lafleur talks about um, how at that time period in Japan with Buddhism, the understanding of Anicca was what he would call a soft interpretation of Anicca. And I thought that was such a beautiful way to describe it, so that people interpreted change and impermanence just like a beautiful autumn leaf you know, falling from the tree onto the ground. So that people took great comfort in the cycles of nature and that they would repeat. So there was a, a sense that there was change, but that these cy there, that was comfort in the cycle of the um, change and that the change was benign and comfortable. And they saw it great the great comfort in the Buddhist teaching on Anicca, but it was not including what William Lafer called the hard interpretation of Anicca of earthquakes, right? And floods and fires, which also um, happened in Japan at that time, but people didn't include it in the, in the Buddhist understanding. Which is very interesting, yeah? That that even in that, uh, there was a shying away from the aspects of nature that are ravaging or brutal, unkind. So in the Buddha's teaching, as we understand it, the equanimity the peace that comes through, again, applying the mindfulness and understanding, having insight into anicca, dukkha, and anatta, that, um, that peace is impartiality. It includes that range of soft and hard uh, of change. It includes the range of pleasant, neutral, and unpleasant. 
and sometimes we can call it the heart that has landed. The heart has landed in moment-to-moment -moment change, but in the midst of it, it, we're in the midst of it. So I, I think of one, one aspect of the spiritual journey in our lifetime is, is like the heart mind, it has to stretch. It, it stretches to include the difficult, the unpleasant, right? It, 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 it's, it stretches to include from when we shift from it being pleasant and things seemingly going more our way to things seemingly really <laughs> not going our way, right? The, that, that sense of um, including, including and understanding and caring about how things are. Or another way we could say that is including how pleasant, unpleasant, neutral and flow unfolds moment to moment for all of us. Or how moment to moment six door, sense, sense door awareness unfolds, right? And so in that way, the Buddha taught that the unfolding of karma or kama is imponderable. Imponderable. <laughs> Where are you? Okay. Uh, this is from Sri Nazargadatta Maharaj. Keep very quiet and watch what comes to the surface of the mind. Reject the known. Welcome the so far unknown and reject it in its turn. Then you come to a place where there's no knowledge, only being. Usually you have to be sad to know gladness and glad to know sadness. True happiness is not the opposite of sorrow. It includes all sorrow and suffering. So this is the equanimity. Yeah, this is the peace where the happiness of peace includes that range of joy and sorrow. And when we try to figure it out intellectually, but where he's saying that we go from knowledge to true being, right? Knowledge to being. That, that um, especially, I think, in painful and turbulent times, this trying to figure things out in our head will often lead to more confusion, less genuine compassion, less genuine wisdom. Um, and, and really taking in the Buddha's teaching that this unfolding of karma or kama is imponderable. When we see ourselves doing this churning, kind of churning and churning in the mind, it's often because we're not accepting how things are. We're not accepting the painful aspects of, of how things are. And this when we kind of tune into imponderability, I find there's like this larger perspective. It's like suddenly we're on top of the mountain looking down at everything and seeing that when we do that, that leads to unconditional peace. Again, that's, that's equanimity. There's no conditions on the moment. There's no conditions on the experience without conditions, without conditions. It's, it's accepting things how they are. Not condoning how things are, which is so important. It's not, it's not condoning that there's this range of joy and sorrow. It's, it's just accepting that that's how it is. And there's a, a deep um, quiet that can happen, a deep uh, freedom that happens from this perspective. Way, way back in 1969, <laughs> the fall of 69, when I um, started college in Springfield, Massachusetts, 
and it was a, a jock school. It was a sociology school, but also a jock school. And um, I wasn't adjusting well to dorm life. I had lived alone for two years in high school, completely alone. And so having, in those years, there were rules. Like we were locked into our dorm at night. We had to be like <laughs> in by, I think, 8 p.m. or something. I couldn't deal with it. I just found it, um, having lived alone for two years, I felt that the lack of trust in us was so um, unacceptable. So I started, I didn't say anything. I just started staying out all night and it was in the city, but we had a great, beautiful pond and a railroad. And um, I started even immersing myself in nature more than I had, which is a lot. Like, I had already been immersing myself in nature a lot. So um, I had discovered um, this the sunrise at this particular spot, um, and I was out all night watching the stars, and I was feeling so utterly connected with myself and the and the and the the earth and the stars and the sunrise. And I I would um, later in life I would call it a peak experience, but at the time I just was so high, like from it, so happy, uh, so, um, such joyful interest. And just as the sun started to come up, um, the dorm, there was a big dorm behind me in the back of the hill. And on the, t this was a, and also known as a party dorm, but, um, uh, there were several men on the top floor that opened their windows just as the sun rose and started vomiting they started just retching and retching and I was I was so disturbed <laughs> I was so offended I was so mad right like just like how could these people like disturb <laughs> my peace right and on top of it they were retching into this garden of this professor that I really um I'd never had a teacher like that that um, could see some potential in me. Uh, and so they also uh, took their beer bottles and broke broke them and threw them onto the garden. Um, and um, then I was more upset um, knowing that this professor was a Quaker and nonviolent. I didn't know him as well as I'd like to, but he just started cleaning things up after a couple hours later. I was, I came to class and he worked with it. He, he, he showed no sign of pretending that he was okay. He was okay. One time we went my class went on a field trip with him, and uh, he was such a s sensitive being. He had polio when he was young. I, there were many things being a Quaker, but he was very uh, different than most people I knew at the time. Uh, and <laughs> it started to rain, and there were little um, bubbles of rain, raindrops on the windows. And he had a microphone where he was always interpreting this pond and this geology and this like, and, and these people were not ever listening to him. They didn't like him. They found him irritating. They didn't want to learn. <laughs> and so I was listening to him and he, he said, look at each raindrop and you can see your image in each raindrop and then it'll disappear. And I just love this. I just thought this is fabulous. But um, he just, I think I might have been the only person in the bus listening to him. And that experience of the juxtaposition of such a peak experience of joy and then the, the vomiting and the broken glass. And of course, my mother uh, was drunk most of, almost all the time. So of course that probably triggered that as well, which I didn't know. But um, I think that finding the 
Sayadaw Upandita went right early in the course in 1984. He called mindfulness, um, now he said that uh, my, a moment of mindfulness includes that you understand that anything can happen. That it's strong. It's, it's a strong awareness. It's strong because you get that anything can happen. It's not the moment later that you get anything to happen, can happen. It's that you understand anything can happen. That is mindfulness. And then later when I read Suzuki Roshi's in the book Beginner's Mind that he called mindfulness soft readiness. It's like, ah, oh, these this is gold. This these this is trans these translations are um, so helpful. Again, because we get oh yeah, it can go from it can go from a peak experience to vomiting, right, in a second. And that's, that's kind of still benign in comparison to a lot of things that can happen. So, um, but it's, it's getting that it's not offensive, it's how things are. It can feel offensive, but it, it, the experience can, we can have a response to it that's offended. But, but actually, in fact, it's just moment to moment, sixth sense door awareness. Karma unfolding moment by moment. And I'm describing that particular experience because I could, I could even then get how attached I was. I was so attached to the peak experience and so resistant of the vomiting, right? Like I just, I like, I didn't understand how to work with it yet, but I definitely <laughs> could see I was suffering from it. Um, yeah. At the same time, at that time period of my life, I um, had put up, before this happened even, I had put up a little uh, sign in my room that's uh, by Lao Tzu. And it, it said, he who feels punctured must once have been a bubble. He who feels punctured must one have once must once have been a bubble. And when I walked in my room <laughs> that morning, I was like, "Oh, right, yeah, right, okay." That I feel punctured, but I didn't. I didn't get that the bubble is anatta. It's a moment of identification. Yeah, that's all. moment-to-moment, moment, sixth sense door awareness. There's a sound, it's gone. There's a sight, there's gone. It's a thought, there's gone. What we call me or I or mine or you or us or they, however we use a pronoun, it's, um, it's just these moments of it's either my, my sound or just a sound coming and going. It's my anger or it's just anger coming and going. It's all the difference in the world. We had um, a massive flood Saturday before last. Um, and last night and this morning we had a mo most amazing gentle rain. And we, we have been in an very intense des uh, drought, very intense drought. So the flood didn't absorb much, and I'll t speak to that later, but this is just this, again, this juxtaposition of a very damaging flood and gentle rain. This rain just has just been sinking into the a hard desert soil much more than the flood did. Um, And I have to say, I don't think I've ever seen in like this one place where there's a puddle, right? We, I get one puddle. Actually, when I was up in uh, British Columbia and teaching up at Hollyhock where it rains, right? It actually rains. There's puddles all the time. And then I was down at the ocean and there's like tons of puddles like at low tide. And I was, I almost felt like my one little puddle here, if it ever rains, is, I felt kind of 
diminished or you know, something, something not enough. Or it was so um, intense. I d I'm in the desert most of the time. So the, this morning, here they were, the, the, the rain, this gentle rain, and the, the puddle had grown. And um, there are bubbles. And there's never been bubbles. And not only were there bubbles from each raindrop hitting, but my image, my image was in every bubble. Just like from that bus trip I took, so, you know, 1969, right? And I was like, oh, just like, how can that even be? How can nature even present us with that? And not only was my image in each bubble, but the next raindrop would puncture it. He who feels punctured must once have been a bubble. So I'm watching that like process of, you know, do we identify with our image or not? Do I ident identify with a bubble? Do we want it to last? That whole, I've always felt like this puddle teaches me so much. <laughs> and here we were again with a different angle on it. Nisargadatta says, believe me, you can't have too much destruction. Moment by moment, sixth sense door awareness passing, each moment passing every moment. If you if you get it, if you get it, it's like that's how it is. It's just passing, passing, passing. That's what he's calling the destruction. That awareness, believe me, you can't, you can't, you can't understand that enough. That's where peace happens. I started driving before I had my license because my mom died when I was 13 and I, I had to. Um, and that, that also that autumn of the same experience, the peak experience with the sunrise, I was driving in the rain and uh, it was autumn and these there's a certain point in autumn where the sugar maples turn yellow and gold and then they start falling and it's so again <laughs> beautiful the, the 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 earth is covered with these golden golden huge sugar maple leaves but also there some, a lot are still on the, the trees and it was raining so the vividness of the color was so powerful and intense and i know that of course the sun the sun and the chlorophyll and the photosynthesis all create this this food for the tree, yeah. And then I always think, well, and then the tree gives back the, the color. It gives back the sun before it dies with the leaves uh, colored, colored. It's so beautiful. And I was just not through intellectual understanding, but just receiving that in the rain. And the, it just punctured the grief so deeply of my mom dying. I hadn't really cried. And it was so moving for me. Like here I am in the rain and the tears and the weeping. And um, I think it was such an important place of, I think it's the first time I really had deeply accepted that my mother died. It wasn't. I'm not saying that was permanent, but it was like a, it was a glimpse. It was a glimpse of the possibility of accepting death. As an aside that I won't go into that much, but yesterday I was, um, driving and listening to, I just started listening to the radio since March 1st, starting my retreat. I'm venturing forth to listen to a little bit of something. Uh, and I'm just, I'm just turning the radio off if I don't feel up to hearing too much yet. But there was a, um, an amazing article about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, like amazing. Um, 
and I didn't have a chance to hear the whole of it, but what was so moving to me was how much I didn't know about her. And she wrote the book on living and dying, um, it, and sh it was so, so transforming a teaching about death and accepting death and accepting dying and talking to people who were dying. Um, when my mom died, there was no one mentioned it. My father didn't mention it. My sisters didn't mention it. My teachers at school didn't mention it. <laughs> my neighbors didn't mention it. It was like, it was unmentionable. Some of us might not remember it even that clearly, but this article really woke me up to how it was back then. And uh, I'm not going to go into it that much, but basically she spent years trying to get hospitals to let her come in and talk to somebody dying as research from the university. Uh, and she, she, they wouldn't let her, so she started kind of walking around the hospitals anyway. And she couldn't even find somebody dying. Because they put them away so you couldn't, you, they put them really far away and hid them because nobody wanted to deal with it. And th this was very moving. It's like she would walk down a corridor as she started to get more um, permission to do what she was doing. And she said doctors and nurses would actually spit on her. And I'm saying this mainly also to just honor her. Like, I just had no idea what she did for all of us. Like, the level of what she did for all of us in terms of accepting dying and hospice and death. It was just like, in terms of um, the, the person who, from Canada, um, a man from the university spent much time with her as she, after her book came out, and he said she was like a rock star. <laughs> Wherever she went, all over the world, you know, she said, he said that in, when she was in a bathroom stall, somebody put her book under the stall so she would sign it. I mean, that's how Again, like the love uh, that this woman brought out in everyone on the planet for like doing what she did is so moving. I just have to say I was so grateful, so grateful to hear it because of especially my experience. I, I look back and I, I was totally alone with my mom dying, completely, totally alone. And luckily, the woman across the street, who's still a good friend, she gave me the book Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, which saved me. There was the Buddha. So I mentioned this flood, so this is Sunday, so the Saturday before last, I had an appointment in uh, 30 minutes from my house up at 3,000 feet. I live near sea level, um, and the highways were closed because of the flood, and this has never happened here before, <coughs> so it was a much worse flood than we've ever had, just in one night. Um, and so I really wanted this appointment. Um, so I <laughs> drove up the highway just this little bit and begged um, this neighborhood that's gated. I begged them to let me drive up because they have a, a route up the mountain and they have a gate on each side and, and they, they let me go through. Yay. And nobody was out on the roads. It was very early in the morning. So you drive up to 3,900 feet and then eventually come down the mountain to 3,000 feet. And I have to say, this range of joy and sorrow was so apparent. It's like the beauty of the gushing of the water. There were waterfalls. There were waterfalls everywhere. And the sun came out and it was just it was spectacular. Just, it was spectacular beyond belief. <laughs> and then coming down the mountain, looking out, there's three, 
huge mountains on this island. One of the highest in the world, one of the biggest, and the largest in the world. And there is this vast kind of plain, desert plain, at the bottom of them. And there were ponds of water. Like, there's never been water there. It's, a, it's unbelievable. And it was just tons of water and s the sun sparkling on them. Um, and yet I knew there was such destruction going on down below. And to hold that, for all of us to hold that, like on the, on the planet now, this range of, of beauty that we g get to experience still, and yet there's also so much destruction. And I think that this is so important. Vipassana and the Brahma Viharas are what allows us to stretch. And as I stretched to this, I started weeping. And it felt so good. It just felt, oh my God, I have been, the last few years have been so much loss and so hard. And it just punctured it. It punctured it. Hallelujah. I don't think I want to. Here it is. This is Segyo. It will be good. My body may cry itself into a pond of tears, but in it, my unchanged heart will give lodging to the moon. Sometimes we, right, that just like something just finally cracks. We resist that range of joy and sorrow and being here on the planet, the karma unfolding. But it will be good. <laughs> my body may cry itself into a pond of tears, but in it my unchanged heart will give lodging to the moon. He lived in the 1100s. Imponderable karma. Getting that we can be here and live out karma is no small matter. Understanding what we're doing. And getting that this kind of range, you know, Jesse uh, went to a pride march this morning uh, where he is staying. And he sent me a video, and there was so much fun and so much celebration. It was so beautiful. And then he kept the video going, and there was a man on a loudspeaker, and he was, and he had signs, and he was screaming all about that they were sinning and hellfire and going to hell and it was just like there it is yeah i kept thinking but they're in california <laughs> why do why is this happening in california right i'm i'm naive about that but it's just like wow but still yeah this range of joy and sorrow So before the flood, before the flood, before going to Canada, the month before that, there were two huge herds of wild goats that had started to come down the mountain, I think because of the, the drought. I'm not sure, but um, there's nothing to eat. And um, there's like 15 to 16 goats in a herd. <laughs> and they started coming near the near the house, and there's a gulch next to my house that's e only once or t once every two years. Every year, there's water that comes down from the mountain. The rain has to come in a very particular place up in the mountain for rain or water to come down. Um, so they they started 
standing on, on the cross the gold and I'm like no actually no we we don't want you over here <laughs> but you come down you come back from being shopping like food shopping and there they are eating everything I love in my yard like eating all the blood sweat and tears of labor for year 13 years eating my favorite plant <laughs> eating my rare native Hawaiian palm tree you know and it's like the, it's that sense again of that offensiveness of it um you know they jesse built this beautiful bamboo fence around two of my guard herb gardens and another garden and um i saw this huge male goat just like step on it like he just stomped on it he didn't it was effortless like it, it was effortless and like eating things and i'm like and i'm honking the horn <laughs> no 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 go and then that happened twice and then um the third time a goat got stuck in this other fence that i you know we inherited when i bought this place but then i had to look at the goat and think well which side do i cut the fence so it doesn't hurt me right you know and it just took a long time to say okay i have to go around the or go far around and cut the wires because it can kick me, right? This has happened twice. Um, and this was all um, the month before now. It, it's very intense how much they've eaten. Like it's, it's, it's <laughs> so I was um, irritated with them. Uh, and then um, the flood happened, and my my just my little cement area that I walk on when I come out of the house was covered with debris. It's that has never happened before. Just it it was an amazing flood, and one night I tripped and fell again. So this is my third fall. I'm okay. It wasn't as bad as the others. It's it's a fall on cement, but. Um, and that night, I started to smell a bad smell, like a very um, awful smell. And at first, it seemed like it was the runoff. You know, this massive amount of water came down, right, and runoff from ranches and stuff and uh, people's yards. And so I investigated, and I went down um, to the neighbor across the street and, <laughs> and smell. I was smelling their their gold. And it was all like the same smell, and I'm like, okay, okay. Um, but then the next day, the smell was the smell of death. Really intense. Um, like so intense that I had to close my windows. That it, it's hot here, right? I closed the windows. I couldn't deal with it. Like it was so small, so strong. Uh, so eventually, I think it was two days ago or something. Um, I shouldn't have done it because it's it's not. It's dangerous in, in the gulch now because of all the deep mud and deep grasses. And But I walked down to the road, and, and I couldn't not go. And I had a cane, and I went in. Um, and in this gulch, there are trees growing in the middle of the gulch now, uh, keave trees, mesquite trees. Um, and there was a, a mother goat and a baby goat in different places that had died in the flood. <laughs> and I could tell that there's probably two, a few more up the gulch I didn't go, but you could, I could hear the flies and the smell. <laughs> um, and it was just so sad. Like I it's unimaginably sad, and I was just standing there, sending the meta, and hoping that they had died quickly. Like I just, ugh, I hope it wasn't horrible. But they they got caught, right? The water was so high, and they got caught in these trees. So um, there they are. And then I I was there, even though it was so bad a smell. I was. I was starting to think of how much 
of my plants they had eaten. And I felt so horrible for being irritated. Like I just, I felt like it was one of the most powerful teachings for me in my lifetime. It was like I, oh, I can't say that. It's like here, th I felt so much mudita that they had had this banquet. They had a banquet. They had days and days of feasting. And um, I'm so happy that they had that before they died. I was so grateful that we could give them that. <laughs> and I never, I never want to be irritated with anyone or any being again in my life. <laughs> it was so intense. We don't see the big picture. We don't see the karma. It's imponderable. Somebody's bothering us, some human, and we don't, we don't see the big picture of maybe five lifetimes ago something happened that they have still been resisting and they can't open yet, right? We, they get, we have people we think should be better than they are and they're meditation teachers <laughs> and, they, and we don't see that they're working this stuff out like we all are. Goats, <laughs> roosters, sharks, fish stars. And of course we don't, I don't, I didn't want the goats to eat my precious plant. I'm not saying that that was wrong. Of course I don't. But to get that we don't get what's really going on, that it's imponderable, right? And it takes so much practice. It takes so much Brahma Vihara practice. The Brahma Viharas are fortifying. They're strengthening. They're uh, and the Vipassana, the wisdom practice, the freedom, the liberation teachings. You know, living out the karma is the only way to grasp any of this. Yeah instead of fighting it, fighting it all the time. And I think of Deepama and how she encouraged us to have our hand on our heart center and practice metta even if it's three seconds and have our hand on our abdomen, belly and notice the movement of the breath coming and going. It can be three to five seconds, especially before we sleep. And that practice has become so important for me lately. When I was up at Hollyhock teaching, I'm allergic to a lot of the buildings, and there's one place I barely managed to be in. And part way through the retreat, um, this massive sewage explosion happened in my room. Like it went all over everything, everywhere, like massive. And it was very hard for my heart to stretch <laughs> to accept it. Like it was so painful and so awful. And so um, I had nowhere to go. And I think that what's so funny about it is that it's so beautiful there. I mean, you know, the eagles are sweeping down, right? The ravens and the t ocean, and it's like, and this massive, massive explosion over everything <laughs> I had. And, you know, Jesse was so kind to let me, I, c I had to sleep on his couch because I couldn't even, he couldn't trade with me to be in his room. I'm so allergic. Um, and it, again, it was like, but I just like that first night, I was just like, okay, when, when do these teachings really come in to help us? And it actually uh, got much stronger. Just the, the compassion was not just, not just the rising movement, but 
every part of my being and then and just everywhere right and then the falling movement right you can either do vipassana with it and see it all as impermanent right or just abide in the boundlessness of the compassion and with each breath it's like it can be kindness compassion mudita empathetic joy peace equanimity these practices are that powerful so that we're in a complete total energy field of kindness and accepting impermanence and accepting the range of joy and sorrow how things are the nature of how things are what great fortune we have to be have such good karma to have access to these teachings especially at this time on the planet where it's so so needed all it takes is having our hand on the belly and taking it all in with great compassion and then understanding it's impermanent taking it all in with kindness with empathetic joy with peace boundlessly, immensely, microscopically. Understanding it's moment by moment, a sixth sense door, awareness of change. What do you think, Jesse? Bas, bas, enough. Yes. Very good, Michelle. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, everybody. Mm. Take care of yourselves and one another. We'll see you next Sunday.